this video, we are drawing a tree in watercolor. The goal, as always, is to have fun. But I want you to keep a couple of ideas in mind. Moisture, consistency, and patience. Moisture means paying attention to the level of wetness of your paper, whether it's wet, moist, damp, or dry, and which one is the perfect in terms of timing for you to deliver the ideal technique. Consistency means the ratio of water and pigment. So the more water, less pigment, or the more pigment, less water, you're going to develop from light to dark in terms of value and consistency. Patience. This means knowing how to take a breath, how to pace yourself, and how to allow everything to work together for you to deliver that perfect vision. So let's get to it. What I want to do here is just a quick reminder on this side of my sketchbook. And you can actually follow along. I'm going to grab my brush. And I'm actually going to use this one for starters, my water brush. That we've all kind of been a little familiar. I've talked about it a lot. Um, and I'm going to select from my palette. Now, this I'm going to show you very quickly here. I have a palette of 36. Usually, I would recommend a maximum of six to 12 colors, 15 colors. It's already a little much. This is just obviously for class and showing you um, the full range of warms, yellows, reds, our blues, and in this case today, our greens. What I wanna do is I'm gonna show you what I mean by selecting a cool yellow. And I'm just gonna basically drop it in and do create sort of a quick little chart. I'm going to remove this very quickly here. So you have a cool yellow and I can actually label that. And I want to do this exercise just really quickly. And that would be my cadmium yellow. And I'm going to take my cool blue, which is my cobalt blue. I'm going to place it side by side. Now I can do this and this is very generic. On my palette, I'm going to grab those two colors again. And I'm going to mix a sort of a ratio of them. And this is my color combination for those two colors. So exploring a little bit of your greens. And I highly recommend doing this. We're not going to spend too much time, uh, class time today, doing this. But I just want to show you a quick variation. Whether you have one yellow or two yellows, and I always recommend having at least two. This is the same cool yellow, which is my cobalt yellow. But now I'm going to place it next to my warm blue. And I hope you can see the difference. This blue is a little more, it's a little warmer. It has a little more violet in it. And I'll do the same. I'll mix just a touch of yellow with a touch of ultramarine blue and hopefully you can see the difference. Now I can add a little more yellow or a little more blue to these greens and begin to have a spectrum of the range of those two colors mixed having a bluer green or a yellower green uh, with each of these which each of these mixes. If you have greens on your palette, I would also create a chart. And for these, I would do the same. I would take my green. In this case, it's a chrome oxide green, very earthy, kind of neutral. And I'm going to also mix it with my cool yellow. So this is just one quick exercise. And I hope you do try this. I'm going to take those two colors again. And I'm going to add just a touch. It's actually very staining. So it takes a lot of yellow with a tiny, tiny bit of green to actually notice a difference. And there it is. And it may look a little too yellow. Still, add a little more. And I'll do the same with the same 
Let's go ahead and do it. The same chrome oxide green. But this time I'll add blue. So I'm going to add the same cobalt blue, my cool blue. Place it here by the side. And then mix them. So I'll take a little bit of cobalt blue. I'll take a little bit of that oxide green. And we come up with, wow, a very beautiful, this is a great neutralized gray green. And as I said, you can make it more green, in this case, more green or more blue. So imagine the possibilities. And I want to show you something very, very quickly. This is my sketchbook where I'm going to move this very just to the side for a second. I think I've shown you this before. This is my sketchbook where I catalog all the colors. And this is the mapping of my colors, the colors that I own. This is more blues and earth tones. So basically you can catalog and then create these charts. But the most important one I want to show you today is this is consistency of each pigment transparencies and you can do exercises as well which is what we're planning this is how we glaze colors meaning we lay one on top of a dry uh, we layer one dry it and then lay a second color on top of it that's the mixture of colors we get but the one I want to show you today is greens so here's here's how far you can go so taking all of my yellows and mixing with the blues and some of the greens that I have you have a catalog of all the varieties and this is just one of the infinity colors of spectrum in the green that you can create and I do the same for my violets and for my browns and oranges and grays and this is one way to really really one of my most one of my favorite pages is this one here where we combine our grays and blacks from blues and earth tones so all of these experiments it's basically going to a to a laboratory and mixing mixing but recording in order to see to have a record of what would happen and then how can i use it which brings us to our tree so obviously we're going to be using lots of green and when I say a lot, maybe a little more specific would be tints and shades of one or two greens. And we, you notice as you look at the image, we have the green grass, we have the blue sky. And we're also going to play a little bit with technique. So if you choose to draw just a little bit, and it could be as easy as this. You could just draw your horizon line and just maybe place a little line and I'm making it so light because I don't want it to show that's it how far this one will go this way and how much of the second one we have there but I don't want to make this a drawing I you may you may have heard me say that a good drawing makes a good watercolor well today we're gonna work with we're gonna draw with color so selecting my brush, my first brush, and the main idea here is also strategizing. So we're gonna work from the background all the way to the foreground. And that makes, us a, makes it a little bit simpler. The background is blue, it's a blue sky. Um, I wanna show you something else. If you have masking tape, this may be one where I want to add a little frame to it just to make it look a little more professional, a little cleaner, since I plan to go maybe all the way to the edge. I'm just gonna place a little tape on each of the sides. Make that very quick. So by masking, I have my proportions. I can make this bigger or smaller and just following the edges will do for this one and I'm going to play a little bit with the composition where the tree stays pretty much in the middle so the strategy is 
working from background to foreground and working from very, very light to dark. And that's what I want to do. So noticing that there are colors that will obviously combine and work, for example, the blue of the sky, I don't have to preserve any color. I could actually, some of the lighter areas, it could be that very light blue. So I'm going to start with the first coat and I'm going to make this wet on wet. You could select any of the techniques we've looked at. Wet on dry would be a, a nice, just a nice clean wash. I'm choosing wet on wet because the overall image, I want it to be, I want you to be able to see the watercolor techniques and some of the brush strokes all the way through. That's going to be that's how I envision it. So I'm stopping right at the right at the horizon and I have my color selected already. I know it's a cerulean blue. So I'm going to just grab a little bit of that. And if I want, I could tilt it just a little bit so it gravity does a little bit of of the work. And I'm just beautifully laying down wet on wet. Notice how I'm staying a little bit away from the middle, having maybe a little lighter area in and around the tree. But another beautiful thing about a tree is you have pockets of sky that pop through it. So I'm going to touch a little bit of blue in and around those areas. Now it's very wet, so it's going to run and it's going to do a lot of granulation. And I would hope to keep this. Let's add a little more. And just let it run. There we go. Now this technique does require lots of patience. Lots of patience. Because most of it, you want the ideal of this type of technique with watercolor drawing with watercolor would be just wet on dry but because of what i did here we have to wait until this dries beyond damp so with damp there won't be that much granulation or bleeding of one color into the other but because it's so wet i'm going to make sure i wait long enough and that happens naturally while I spend some time mixing my grass. So from the little exercise we did earlier, I still have some leftover paint that I mixed, which was in this case, it was, that's why we keep a chart. It was my ultramarine blue with cobalt yellow. And this one I'm gonna lay down wet on dry. So the, this part of the paper is dry. Notice the difference. And I'm going to try to get a little bit of dry brush in there. And I'm going to be very cautious here with, with that edge. So if you notice, there's a little yellow that becomes a little bit stronger green. So I want that to be my first. This is going to be my first layer. And the strategy overall today is that as it dries, I can come back right over. And I'm doing this right now in this dry area and have those colors either blend in. Notice here how it's because it wasn't as wet, they're not blending as much. But I'm also using my brush to draw with the paint. So beginning to just dab and kind of drag and stab with the brush to create some of that grass pattern. I don't want to do every single individual grass. I do patches. We see here that we have a little bit of shadow. So that's going to be a beautiful shade of this green. And a little bit of the transition to that yellow, which is better. 
by bringing a little bit of water and softening that edge. So playing with your techniques, getting a little more elaborate with working somewhat of a simplistic patch of grass with multiple techniques. Remember, we did this wet on dry, then we did a little bit of dry brush. Now I'm doing a little more wet on wet. So I mixed the color on the palette, then brought it to the paper, but I'm also mixing color on the paper. And if that's not enough, I'm going to have a third green, which was the cool blue with my cool yellow. And I'm going to touch that remainder down here. It's getting a little too vibrant, a little too blue. So the key is going to be, how do I mix colors? How do I time the mixing of that color to create as many beautiful techniques but with simplicity. So already I have a beautiful landscape going on. It looks like it's raining. And I like that. That's the beauty of watercolor, that it can show you, it can surprise you. It's very different from just doing a wet on dry and just a flat blue sky. I love them, they're beautiful, but I wanted a little bit of that and let that water and gravity play with it. So this is still very wet. And can I use that? Well. For some of the sharper edges, it's not gonna work. So I have to be very careful. I'm gonna stick with this brush still pretty much almost all the way through. I may be switching to my quill, which is a squirrel brush. And it does beautifully with, with when I need to add moisture. But I will probably also go down to a very small, this is a number one brush around when I begin to sharpen those details. So just by the look of it, and obviously you you don't wanna risk touching it and lifting pigment, but I could see it's beyond moist. So we have wet, wet becomes moist, moist becomes damp, and then damp becomes dry. And then from dry, we go to bone dry. So right now I'm between moist and damp. Can I use that? for the watercolor technique that I would want to apply. Now, first thing comes, remember, ah. we also said we're gonna be working from background to foreground. So we need to deconstruct this tree. Lighter areas and then build up to the dark. So we're also working with some of the bigger and simpler shapes but we're considering the lighter. So the color that I see, I want that green to match temperature. So the way I want you to think about this is, is this green cool or warm? Does it feel cool or warm? And you're gonna see areas of the tree, the foliage that are very cool, meaning they're yellower, and some that are warmer, I'm sorry, warmer would be that yellower sometimes going a little bit towards orange even, like a brown color. And then the cooler, which would be the darker greens or some that even look blue. So with this and making sure my paper is at the right moisture, the right amount of moisture on my brush, what I wanna do is begin to, I don't wanna draw each individual leaf or clump of leaf here. Okay, and this was a lot of water. But what I want to do is lay down, and this is going to take way too long to, to dry. So I'm going to drag some of this up. And what I'm looking at is clumps of leaves that I get a little smaller. One big element that I'm going to introduce to my tree that I want to showcase and that it's going to be a big part of is the negative space. So the space between those clusters. Notice also, if you could see, the consistency of my pigment is very light, meaning there's lots more water than pigment. Because the goal here is to build the tree, develop it from lightest to darkest. 
and just instead of painting i'm drawing so what is well for painting as well but for drawing you need to keep your eyes on your subject you really need to connect see the elements but you can also play maybe do a little reconstruction of or reimagining and maybe a different interpretation of this tree but hopefully you have it's for the right reasons not because of a whoopsie oh whoopsie i didn't see that okay well i'll just leave it like that no it should be well i want it fluffier here maybe i do want it to go or i, I want it rounder that kind of play yes absolutely it's very creative and you want to keep it also a little random in terms of technique i want to show you just a little bit closer how the dabbing and so you could see a little more the type of saturation the type of moisture and maybe the even the type of motion where it's a little bit scumbling with the brush and at the same time that i'm dropping these little bubbles of color these little clusters i'm also thinking about what's going to happen later which is obviously layers of wet on wet and obviously i could be doing some of that right now or the tree trunks and how they're going to play a part in that so saturation and the lightness of your pigment is crucial here notice that it's almost transparent the other thing you want to do is mix enough so you're not mixing in between and what you're seeing here it's me basically doing wet on dry because the paper now is very very dry that that was going to be my question my my green is just bleeding it's not sitting on top like yours is it's kind of bleeding into the blue is that uh, because my paper's too wet maybe? yes and okay. well one thing i recommend for that is just wait it out if you if you can if you're waiting for one area to that's too wet to dry and you can work on a, on another area you let that happen most people will use a blow dryer and i highly recommend against it if you can wait now you see that i am adding lots of water here so this could take a lot longer but i'm doing it on purpose because i want it to stay a little wetter so i can come back and i'll go ahead and show you what i'm gonna i plan on doing and this may be too soon so this is what's happening to you you're dropping pigment and it's just going all over the place right and this one actually behaved. Correct. Uh-huh. So it's not going to give you sharp edges. And I may have done too much of it. You're definitely... The, the name of the game, the key, the secret is know your moisture. So the, way, the more familiar you become with how your brush, your paper, and your pigment react as you do a technique uh that's what we're trying to do today it's not just wrong and i know you're handling it feels like you're juggling 10 things because you are dealing with the wetness of the paper the wetness on the pigment i gotta mix the colors is it warm is it cool oh and by the way i'm also drawing a tree and i'm i gotta keep it going and there's a lot of things but breaking them down where spend a little time mixing the colors have them ready and when you can plan the stage and the level of moisture that you that you only focus on that that works really really well now if you have to stop and wait you shouldn't just sit there you could be doing maybe some color mixing um maybe some experimenting with mixes and colors some charts on the other side as well uh, you do want to be careful not to move it around too much. And also not to lose focus. Okay, where was I? That that can actually show up in your in your in your work. But you generally see what I'm doing here with the shape. And I was showing you, you can see by because of the reflection of the light, areas that are beginning to dry a lot faster and areas that are still, look at that, very wet because I added so much more 
moisture and pigment and as I said it was on purpose so I can come back and do a little bit of wet on wet to that area so in many ways the name of the game is patience patience to mix the right color the right consistency because you're also dealing with the value of the color notice if I mix this a little more pigment than water it's going to be very very deep and obviously heavier and more saturated the amount of water and making sure you're using the right brush so I'm gonna to switch to this smaller brush here I could actually use this one and I'm going to mix yellow ochre and I'm gonna to touch it with a little bit of red so I want to pull this towards brown but it's actually more of a gray brown especially in that trunk area at the bottom at the base it's almost white the light hits it and you want to make sure you take advantage of that so on second thought it will be better if I do this work with a smaller brush if you have burnt umber you you should start with that color as your base and then begin to think okay do i need it warmer or do i need it cooler do i need to add yellow ochre to it and begin to stretch the spectrum i think i have it here one way to test it is over here swatch it and i'm pointing right over here to this corner where I swatch this color and I think it's exactly what I wanted. I'll be adding a little bit of Payne's Gray. Now you wanna be very careful because there's still very wet areas here that if I touch, they would just bleed all over into that wet green. So you wanna be careful. And as I said, managing the level of moisture, making sure you have basically the patience to know that there is going to be at least two if not three more layers coming up so I'm working a little more on the edges here a little closer to drawing the base just focused on the edges adding a little bit of sepia which is a darker brown than the burnt umber and touching it to create sort of a sensation of shadow on this side. And this is more of that linear work. Basically covering the edges, going back to that burnt umber. Ah. Burnt umber. And adding just a little more water. Notice how it becomes that light gray that I was looking for and it'll look like it's it actually it does begin to look like it's hit by sunlight what I need to happen is make this darker so I just dab in a little more sepia tone there goes into the green and sometimes a little happy accident is a good thing it went in and ooh, it actually makes that green kind of gain a little bit of character now the one thing you don't want to do is have too much bleeding see here I'm lifting and I can always come back so it's the level of saturation so let me explain that a different way you can paint with tea you can paint with coffee you can paint with milk you can paint with butter or you can paint with I'm sorry with honey or you can paint with butter so right now I'm painting with 
tea and coffee. I don't want to bring in butter, which means very thick, and and that's it. I can't go any thicker because your watercolors, they only get so thick, and the thickest would be butter. And if I need to go back to tea, it's going to be too thick already on the paper. So if you build up from thin, from weak tea to coffee, then start bringing in milk, which is, I'm still at coffee, honestly. You'll have way more opportunities to adjust and make corrections or not just corrections, but even new, um, apply new ideas. And you see how some of the color is blending and mixing. I'm letting it. I'm letting it happen. Because I know that when it dries, this is so light. It's that tea that I can come back with more consistent, a little bit thicker green. And it's going to work. Now, is that color? The other thing to consider is, is the color translucent that would it would affect the layer on top of it? Now you do that by testing, but most like you most likely will learn it from experience. The more you use these colors and the more you paint with them, then you realize, well, I can use yellows on top of burnt umbers because it's just too weak of a color. So you then preserve some of those areas where it needs to be yellow. And also I'm working small. So you see a lot of just touching and dabbing and pulling of the pigment. But what I'm trying to do is really let the technique, and most of it is the technique of wet on wet. I really love that technique. Most of it, it would seem, if you look closely, as if I were using wet on dry. But the truth is there's just enough moisture there. And also my lines, as the tree gets taller, they get thinner, but also sharper. And in some cases, a little lighter. This one I want just a little darker. And there you really have to make sure it's dry. If you want that sharpness, that level of sharpness, you got to make sure that the pigment is going to just sit, which would be completely wet on dry. So you can see here how the colors are blending and creating a more natural organic look that there is no way I can draw that. Well, but I guess I did somehow, but no, it's water and pigment and paper and brush. And I just kind of made it happen a little bit, but I can't take credit because that is all watercolor magic. And it's basically that. How wet was the paper? How wet was the pigment? How wet was the brush? Did you, were you aware? And then the other thing you notice is how it begins to handle edges. The drier the paper is, the sharper the edge is going to be. The wetter the paper is, the more blurry those edges are going to be. And that's why really getting to know your techniques and really experimenting and playing with them is what you need to do. The only way to really advance, taking risk. And the bigger the risk, most likely the bigger the payoff. Yeah, of course, the bigger the risk, but there may be a, a bigger chance that you find something new. I'm going to mix a little bit of green again. And this, I have a little leftover from that gray green. So I'm going to use that and I'm going to touch it with a little bit of sepia again you could use black ivory black but avoid just going straight to black if you have to and you're looking at shadows i'm going to give you a great tip here i think neutralizing the color number one 
is the first thing you should look at. And how do you neutralize a color? Well, if I'm working with green, and I'm talking about the grass here, so for these shadows, if I use this green and then I add red to it, red is the complementary of green, so it begins to neutralize, and at some point it becomes a dark gray, and that's how you create more, more natural looking shadows. And again, I'm just drawing this wet on dry. And I know there's a, there's a figure there. For now, I'm going to ignore it. There's a little more red here on the ground, and I want to add it there. And bring back a little darker. And notice that, again, wet on dry. And some of that shadow... That goes all the way out here. And I'm going to bring a little more water to make this even softer edge. And I scumble the line so it has those little pockets of light, as you can see here. And it goes all the way to the horizon, which I'll be able to fix because there's a little hill back here. Um, and I'll be able to bring that back. So this is beginning to look dry once again. And again, it's that level of moisture. You wet it and it starts drying. And the more times you wet it, the more the paper is still soaked with water. At first it takes a little longer, but once it dried fully and you add more water, it dries faster. And you need to pay attention to those conditions as well. Whether you're outdoors, and it's hot and humid, or you're indoors with the AC right, right above your head. All those conditions affect the level of moisture um, that you need to be aware. I'm gonna mix a little more of that green that I use for my foliage, the trees and the leaves, and I'm gonna add a little bit of blue. I'm gonna go with ultramarine blue again. Oof. That went really dark really fast. So let's bring it back. I could add a little yellow as well. The less colors you mix, the more chance you have for harmony. It makes sense when you think about it. The less moving parts, the less chance of an accident. The less colors you mix, the more chance you have at keeping harmony. So it's still, well, actually it went very dry now. So there's a couple of options you have here. You can re-wet the areas. So clean water and bringing just touches of water. And I'm gonna place it here and there. And just little, without rubbing it too hard, you don't want to lift the layer. And then I'm going to bring in the pigment while it's wet. And again, timing it. Timing it so there it is. So we have that wet on wet effect. And if it's too much water, I can dry my brush. So always, always handy. A paper towel where you really dry the brush. And then you can come in and lift. Or the opposite would be, you wet it, you make sure it's at the right level of moisture, and then you drag some of the edges of the pigment. So we have this pigment and we have these wet areas. What I'm trying to do here is just emulate what's happening to some of the shadows. And I don't want to overdo it. And as a second layer, here's I want to point this out. I was mentioning coffee, tea, coffee, milk, honey, butter. When you go from when you go from tea to coffee and then from coffee to milk, it looks beautiful. But if you if you go from coffee to honey, you you kind of have a chance of it stands out is what I'm trying to say it does begin to look like a mistake unless you have an absolute clear purpose of why you would go 
that much darker and why you need to shift the consistency by skipping one of the steps. So this begins to get smaller and smaller. So when it gets smaller, it also gets sharper. And if it gets smaller and sharper and darker, it really, it really demands a lot of attention. You see how it gets heavy. Whenever it's darker, it gets heavier. And if it's smaller and sharper, it makes it even more um, of a focal point. So you want to be careful how much you use of that sh small, sharp, and heavy. Because you could end up having to do every single leaf on the tree. And that's, you don't want that. You want this to be, I mean, you could, and it's a beautiful technique when you, when you try to go realistic, but you want to kind of pull it a little towards abstraction. Deal with shapes, let the technique do what it does best. And manage, manage as best you can your, your patience. It's really thinking through and taking deep breaths. Yes, I know sometimes you have to work fast because, oh my God, it's drying, it's moist, and I got to do that wet on wet right now, and I'm mixing color, and I'm rushing. But you really have to stop, pause, analyze, and most importantly, wait it out. Wait for that perfect magic moment. It's all about timing. And if you catch yourself rushing and you're seeing things that are not making you happy, you got to stop rushing. Got to take a little bit, just a little bit of time between some of these layers. And the more you get familiar with what it takes to develop, let's see, I have one two, three. I'm on my third layer right now. So we started with the blue. Then I did the, the shaping of the tree. And now I'm adding the third. I guess you could call some of the tree trunk third. So it would be the third, fourth layer of paint mixing. And it's still almost translucent. I want it to still be... I'm adding just a little extra dark right here in the middle. And I bring in the color... And it's basically dabbing it and allowing some of that wetness to give it shape. And you see that there is no way I could paint the shapes that wa the watercolor is giving me, the wet on wet technique. What I can do is ruin it <laughs> by over brushing it. So your best bet is to drop it and leave it alone. If you have the right pigment, the right consistency, and that gentle touch with the brush, notice I just touch it in, and then I bring a little bit of wet, just a wet tip to control where I want it to granulate. So it's basically modifications to the technique and when it begins to get a little too dark or a little too saturated, that's when you pause even more. Become a little more careful. Because it's very easy to go too far too fast and lose the qualities. I'm adding just a little more dark right under this branch and bringing it just continue highlighting or making a little more emphasis on these shadow areas. 
So you see some of the branches have light, but then on one side you have light, on the other side, on the other side you have that shadow. So I want to touch up a little, just a little extra without it getting too dark. And I got to say, I'm enjoying this. I'm loving the result. I was worried that I was working a little too small. When you work too small, you have less chance of detailing. It's you got to be more precise. So the brush the brushwork has to be a lot cleaner. And all the different types of brushes that you can use and all the different shapes that you can get from them. Still, the most important thing is how you use moisture to your advantage. The beautiful things you can do with color mixing and layering those mixes of colors. Notice here I'm breaking them into a, just a few smaller more consistent shapes so it has that loose leaf kind of feel but not really it's just again dabbing dropping in some water I want to do something very quick here I'm gonna grab this brush and I'm gonna take a little bit of yellow And I just want to add a little bit of background to this hill. Just behind the tree, I need my horizon line to be just a little bit. And because it's already dry, I could do that. And just come right over and run it right at the edge. Just to create a better sense of space here. And it gets a little blurry. I could actually just add more, a little more of that color in and around. I'm going to lift a little. It got a little too warm. I like the coolness of the color that was there before. So lift just a little bit of this. See, those are those impulsive. Didn't pause, didn't overthink. I just wanted this side, and all of a sudden I'm adding to the other side. And just like that, you could lose it. All that hard work could be gone. So strategizing, being patient and timing the way you work. And we all work at different paces. We all work with different, we all see it differently. We all come up with different ideas on how to apply it, when to apply it. So understanding your strategy and your pace more and more each time that's basically that was the goal of this class and also to finish a beautiful painting of a tree i'm going to add a touch of yellow i want to bring out just a little more of this yellow and combine it giving it a sense of just that light hitting the top of the tree so it'll create a sense of volume and notice how that layer of yellow that I just added mixed with the layer of blue creates an optical illusion of green it's not mixing it's glazing because that blue is very dry and I'm just gonna touch this area here very carefully I should consider switching another brush to a smaller brush maybe and that's a good that's a good thought good choice think a little bit smaller this is my smallest brush and I'm just going to really slowly apply a little bit of contrast a little bit of contrast and the best way to see it is by squinting. Squinting my eyes as hard as I can. And I see shapes of shadow. I see shapes of light. 
And finally, last thing I want to say, the closer we get to the end, so as we get that feeling that we're almost there, we're finishing up, that is where you want to be the most, I don't want to say the most careful, but it is the one time you do not want to rush. Every decision you make, every every decision you make here, is consequential. It, I could call this finished, and you could say, yeah, I agree. So every tiny mark that I decide to continue adding here, is solving a problem or creating a new one. And you have to answer. When is the problem solved? Or how many more marks? How many more? How much darker? Or uh, you name it, solution to the problem does it need? And it's only missing one thing. That little hill back here. And I'm going to see if it's dry enough. It looks dry enough. And this one's a little bit yellower. So I'm going to go ahead with a little warm yellow. And from that shadow, I'll, I'll rework that shadow a little bit. I'll just create that nice little hill back there. There we go. With that little bit of wet on wet. And we have a beautiful scene with the tree. Should I do it? Last thing. We're going to go ahead and put that guy right there. So again, make sure it's fully dry. <laughs> and there it is. That's good. And there we have it. A beautiful watercolor tree. Remember, we we started drawing directly with the brush. Yes, we did a couple pencil lines, but you could really just sketch with a brush and watercolor and it could be anything and just layering strategizing to bring your drawings to life uh, this is an absolutely great technique and i hope you guys enjoyed it <laughs>